And so welcome comrades to Sunday morning at the Marxist library, where we believe that it's time to read Marx again. And so Marxism is spoken here and not to worry, we can provide translation as needed. My name is Eugene Rule, and I will be your host and um, moderator for today's program, which features Tom Gallagher talking socialism with us. We all live in cyberspace right now, but our physical and spiritual home is uh, at, it, at the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue in Oakland, about a mile south of the University of California, Berkeley campus. And since its founding about 30 years ago, the library has served not only as a uh, research library, but also as a community center, providing affordable meeting space for diverse community groups um, involved in our common struggle for racial and social and gender equality and for socialism. The Institute for the Critical Study of Society was formed in 2004 as the research and educational arm of the library to further these same goals. Some of us are members of specific parties and tendencies, others are not. So our workshops, forums and publications do not follow any party line nor do they represent any kind of group consensus on the issues involved. We are united, however, uh, in our respect for the work of Karl Marx and our belief that his work will remain as important for the class struggles of the future as they have been for the past. And we continue to draw inspiration from Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach that the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. And our speaker today exemplifies this Marxian principle. Longtime democratic socialist Tom Gallagher was elected to the Massachusetts state uh, legislature in 1982. Running as an open socialist, he quickly earned the affectionate nickname, Tommy the Commie. Since then, he has remained active and true to his democratic socialist values. Tom has served as a Democratic National Convention delegate for both um, uh, uh, George McGovern in 1984 and Bernie Sanders in 2016. And since moving to the San Francisco, Tom has remained active as a union member with the United Teachers of San Francisco, AFL CIO, and the president of the local Democratic Club in uh, Bernal Heights neighborhood of San Francisco. A longtime anti war and political activist, Tom has authored um, five anti-war resolutions on Iraq and Afghanistan, which were adopted by the San Francisco Democratic Party. Uh, in July 2015, he authored the pamphlet, The Primary Route, uh, how the 99% takes on the military industrial complex, which makes the case for socialists running in the Democratic Party primaries. Um, and uh, Tom acknowledges that um, uh, he has no evidence that either Bernie, AOC, uh, or the squad, or anyone else really has read his book. But uh, uh, and, and he does, um, they do follow these principles. But I should say also that I read the book uh, when I first uh, met Tom uh, in, 20, in the summer of 2015. Um, we invited him to represent the other side uh, at one of our Peace and Freedom Party forums. And he convinced me to go over to the dark side, so to speak. And I've been there ever since. 
Um, Tom is also well versed in Marxian theory, and he teaches a course, I believe that's correct, Tom, uh, on, on Marxism at the San Francisco DSA. So clearly, he's one of us. Let me say one more thing. Uh, I hope folks will listen to Tom with an open mind. I know many of us here regard the uh, uh, Democratic Party as a kind of disease that we want to avoid at all possible costs in case it might be contagious. But I remember um, I had a conversation with Dorothy Healy back in the day, and she was the Southern California chair of the Communist Party during the McCarthy period. And she was one tough old bird, let me tell you that. Um, and I was telling her that I didn't want to associate with Democrats because they were so slimy. And, um, uh, um, and her response was sort of as follows, honey, you're not there looking for a date. You're there because that's where the power is. And I think Tom understands this. So before I go over to Tom, um, let me uh, go over some of our procedures. Uh, he will speak for about 45 minutes, during which time everybody will be muted. Then we'll take a brief break for announcements of upcoming programs. And then we'll go to comments and Q&A, where I will keep a stack and call on people to unmute themselves. And we ask that you stay muted um, unless you're actually speaking to make sure there's no interruptions in case your parrot flies into the room or something like that. So unless Raj or Alan has something to add, we'll go over to you, Tom. Raj? Okay. For me to add, uh, Alan is joining today. So Tom, please go ahead. Okay. All right. Thank you. And uh, thank you for the uh, generous introduction, uh, Gene. You left off, I see the last line that you put in the print introduction. And I actually have had cause to tell myself I should have told Gene to take out the part about how Tom has read all three volumes of Capital. That was a quip I made. I mean, it's true, but it was a quip I made at one of these things a while ago about how I had just completed volume three in the prior year and I was expecting some kind of merit badge. Now, the reason that I, I thought subsequently that I should have asked you to cut it out because what did I get in email when I publicized this a little bit? I got a guy getting back to me saying that he couldn't make it, but he had a question about volume three, both chapters 37 and 58, and the question of uh, the derivation of economic rent from surplus value. Um, now, since I was concerned mostly with the more mundane matters I'm gonna speak about today, I was not able to get back to him, but if I had told you to cut that out, I wouldn't have had to, to deal with that uh, thickly, uh, prickly question. So the real title, more or less, of what I'm going to talk about is uh, something like uh, talking about socialism, talking about talking about socialism, and what we talk about when we talk about socialism. And I will try and explain that. It um, when Gene asked if I wanted to speak at uh, some point, I sort of jumped at doing this sooner rather than later because I was actually mulling some things about this topic about, of talking about socialism. And the main things I was mulling came from a, a, a cartoon strip in the newspaper and a lunch I had in um, Berlin in August that went on for five and a half hours. Um, I'll explain. Uh, first, let me, well, uh, share a screen with you. So um, Dilbert, as some of you will probably be familiar with it, but some may not be. It is a, um, a cartoon strip that's been running for about 30 years, and it's a daily send-up of sort of office politics and general mockery. 
of uh, what goes on in this uh, in Dilbert's Dilbert's office. Uh, for myself, I only read two comic strips a day. Uh, this and Doonesbury, and Doonesbury has been on reruns for I think a couple of years. So this is the only one that's daily showing up with new stuff uh, that I really follow. To my great surprise, as you can see, on Monday, September 20th, one of the characters decided that he had become a socialist. This is Wally. And for those of you who uh, don't have a background in Dilbert, uh, Wally walks around with a cup of coffee, which you can see in his hand, and his whole uh, professional career is devoted to doing as little as possible. And all of a sudden now, 30 years in, Wally has become a socialist. And as you can see, he says, I decided to become more of a socialist. With any luck, I'll benefit from your hard work without adding any value myself. And his coworker says, that feels immoral. And he tells her to get back to work. I have bills to pay. So some of us know the formulation, of course, all of us know the formulation of uh, a conception of socialism from each according to their ability to each according to their need. Uh, this is a conception of uh, socialism uh, from those who work to those who don't work. And this is, um, of course, a you know, one right wing interpretation of socialism that Wally has taken up. Now, I will try to get you the next day's strip. A little luck, it'll show up here. <laughs> All of this. Well, to recapitulate without trying to share the screen at this point. Um, this all starts with the comic strip Dilbert, which is a send up of office politics, um, which is quite uh, sharp, I think. Uh, interesting thing and what used to be called the funny pages. Uh, the beginning of uh, middle of last month, all of a sudden, one of the characters declared himself a socialist. This, this character's name was uh, Wally. Um, he is known for walking around the office at all times with a cup of coffee and avoiding work at all times. And um, so he decides he's a socialist. And without trying to uh, share the screen, I'll tell you what he says. He tells a coworker, I decide to become more of a socialist with any luck. I'll benefit from your hard work without adding my, any value myself. And she says, that feels immoral. And he says, get back to work. I have bills to pay. And uh, it goes on to a, a second day in which he's uh, looking over the show for Dilbert, the character who's the, the main guy in this, who's at work as he usually is. And uh, Wally says, as a newly minted socialist, I look down upon your capitalist ways. Why can't you be more generous and caring like me? And Dilbert says, shouldn't you be working? And Wally says, sipping his coffee, it's optional under my system. So this is a mockery of socialism, of course, right? For uh, it's a transfer of the uh, the motto of from each according to their ability to each according to their needs, to uh, from those who work to those who don't, which is a, a crude characterization of how some people think socialism is uh, supposed to be organized. So. We shouldn't be surprised particularly about this because despite the fact that I, I consider this uh, comic strip a very astute commentary on office politics, it's written a guy, by a guy by the name of Scott Adams who has been known to be a Trump supporter at various points on and off, et cetera. And beyond that, of course, why should we be terribly concerned about what goes on in what used to be called the funny pages of the newspaper? What struck me at that point was that this commentary wasn't necessarily any worse than the commentary you get about socialism in the so-called serious pages in the newspaper. So I decided, well, let me just look around and that nothing, um, uh, I'm not going to do any great historical research. The point is what's being said right about now. So you'll find, I think, or I found, that um, the most prominent source of commentary on socialism in the newspapers is the Republican Party. Um, they have the most to say about it. Uh, according to Newt Gingrich, for example, 
Um, he says the power struggle we are watching in the Democratic Party over the Biden spending bill is not between moderates and big government socialists, it's between timid big government socialists and bolder ones. So for um, Newt Gingrich, the former Speaker of the House, the uh, Democratic Party is entirely socialist at this point. That's, that's one thing. Uh, Kevin McCarthy, who's the uh, minority leader, the uh, representative from California, um, he called the results of the 2020 election a mandate against socialism. Now, despite the fact, of course, that we elected a socialist president, uh, according to Newt Gingrich, uh, what McCarthy thinks is, apparently, the fact that the Republicans did better uh, in the House elections than was expected uh, when they lost the presidential election in the, poly, uh, in the uh, popular vote very heavily uh, was a mandate against socialism. Fairly convoluted, but this is mainstream commentary on socialism in the serious pages of the newspapers. Um, some of you may have seen uh, the comments of Representative Mo Brooks of Alabama, who uh, when there was a bomb threat that uh, evacuated uh, the Capitol building, said he understood why people would, would do that uh, because the, it's an example of citizenry anger directed at dictatorial socialism, which is what he maintains is actually going on in, in the government at this point. The, my favorite of them all, uh, is from Representative Elise Stefanik, and that she'd be less well known than all of these people. Um, she's uh, from New York uh, State. Um, she's now the third ranking Democrat in the House. She's the one who replaced Liz Cheney. And, you know, parenthetically, Liz Cheney has become something of a mainstream hero for recognizing the actual results of the election and thinking that. Um, the uh, Capitol ought not to be stormed, that this really was not proper uh, behavior uh, and uh, the reaction to it on the part of some of our colleagues was not appropriate. This has become uh, you know, a, a bastion of democracy. This is the woman who replaced her. And she uh, made a statement uh, in honor of the anniversary of the passage of Medicare and Medicaid in 1965. And she talked, uh, this was on Twitter actually, about the critical role these problem, uh, these programs have played to protect the health care of millions of families. And then she says, to safeguard our future, we must reject socialist health care schemes. This was in defense of Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, the absurdity of this you know, is obvious. Um, but just to, to, to underline it, when those bills were signed by Lyndon Johnson, uh, Carl Curtis, the Republican from Nebraska, said that this was not only socialism, it is brazen socialism. Barry Goldwater went on his presidential campaign uh, to talk about these things, which were still upcoming at this point in 1964. Um, his quote was, having given our pensioners their medical care in kind, why not food baskets? Why not public housing accommodations? Why not vacation resorts? Why not a ration of cigarettes for those who smoke and a beer for those who drink? Well, other than the, uh, the cigarette part, probably, uh, we probably think most of those programs are pretty good things. But they were, of course, denounced as socialism in their time. And but now Medicare, Medicaid, are things that somehow are anti-socialist because they're obviously good things and anything socialist is a bad thing uh, in Republican uh, ideology. But again, my point here is there's far more discussion like that, obviously, about what socialism is than anything that any of us might have to say about it. The, the discussion that you'll find that's not negative about socialism is a, a strange sort of thing to go back. Uh, Martin Luther King uh, made a statement that is picked up a whole lot um, where he observed that uh, when he was being quizzed about this, we have socialism for the rich and rugged free enterprise capitalism for the poor. 
I think everybody is familiar with some version of that uh, or other. Um, and it's, um, it's sort of a grudging respect for what socialism is supposed to be, that it's good, uh, it is good and only rich people get it. Um, you, some of you may have seen a meme that uh, has been around on the internet lately at, that goes, why when Jesus talks about feeding the poor, it's Christianity, but when a politician does it, it's socialism. And I responded at you know, one point, well, it is, and that's a good thing. But there's this great temerity about discussing any of the positive things about it, uh, even among people who really are fundamentally positively inclined. Well, would it be a good thing? Now, the, uh, as a result, Not, uh, is you know dramatic. Uh, one point, I mean, I, I think everyone would have personal stories. At one point, in a ongoing interchange between members of my high school class, which still goes on to this day, I made mention of being a lifelong socialist. And one of the class mates, who would I'm sure be considered politically sophisticated in certain circles, immediately sent a clipping on Venezuela. Right, because that's you know what he knows is socialism, positive, negative, uh, whatever one makes of all of the events there. It's clearly just one part of the world, one particular experience. But things like this, of course, dominate the discussion of it in in mainstream politics. Um, more significantly, I think, than in in a way, all of this are presumed experts in this field uh, really are not. And I want to, to quote from a Nobel Prize winning economist and columnist, uh, Paul Krugman. And Paul Krugman, some time back um, declared that Bernie Sanders isn't a socialist in any normal sense of the term. And why did he say that? He said it because Sanders doesn't want to nationalize our major industries and replace markets with central planning. Now, there may be people among us who think that that specifically is the definition of socialism. I don't know. A lot of times you'll read articles and they'll refer to Miriam Webster's definition of socialism and it runs along those lines. But having been involved as a socialist really my entire adult life, um, I don't think that is a definition of socialism. I think uh, it is a piece of many people's notion of socialism. Um, is it the be all end all of it that the only thing we regard as a social solution is government nationalization? I don't, I don't think that's the case. Uh, I think most of us would say that nationalization of certain industries, if we could do it, would be, would be wise. Um, nationalization of, of all business, no, not so. Um, I think we would say the democratic control of the economy fundamentally is what socialism is about by whatever means uh, available. But it doesn't, that doesn't fit Krugman's textbook definition. And if somebody who is considered taken that seriously as knowledgeable in economics, which in a lot of respects he of course is, but if that's his definition, and he's considered that authoritative, how can we expect any reasonable discussion of what socialism is um, in, the, in the mainstream press? So also, while I was uh, looking into all of this stuff, I all happened to um, be reading a book coincidentally that had nothing to do with this topic. And it was a biography of a guy who is a famous scholar of Homer. And um, he did most of his serious work. It's almost 100 years ago now. 
And the guy's name, by the way, is Milman Parry. The author of the book was Robert Conigal. And in trying to convey the atmosphere, the political atmosphere that uh, existed in the time that M this guy Milman Parry was doing his work, which had very little to do with his work, um, what the uh, author Conigal had to say, I thought was a very interesting uh, phraseology. Uh, he said there had probably never been a time in recent memory, referring to the 20s, 30s, when the common man, seen as brutalized by an oppressive capitalist system, was viewed more sympathetically, or when the appeal of the left, of socialism in its many shadings, was so strong. Socialism in its many shadings, that's, that's what stuck with me. The idea, I, I referred before to the lack of sophistication in the American public, quite understandably, in the concept of socialism. And you hear it, you go either to Venezuela or Cuba or, or, or what. Um, the idea of there being many shadings to socialism, that it had to talk of that one thing has many meanings and that there are many people with different interpretations of it that it should be considered a broad live movement. Uh, and any live movement has all manner of interpretations of what the, the political goal is. And I thought that was really one of the better formulations of how to, how to look at this uh, that I've really seen that came in a, a publication that had nothing to do with the topic. Um, then I ran across this article um, that was, to me, very evocative in that sense of the, the shadings of socialism. Um, as back from last summer, it was uh, about a, a study, uh, a survey that was done by what is described as a right-wing think tank in the United Kingdom, the Institute of Economic Affairs. And their conclusion was that 16 to 34 year olds were hostile to ca capitalism. And that it wasn't that the, the generation in the, uh, under review was politically disengaged and apathetic as they are portrayed, but in the UK, uh, they found that young people wanted to renationalize the railways, which had been done in the past, energy and water systems, and keep private companies out of the National Health Service. And they thought this wasn't uh, just social media hype. It wasn't something that was going to go away after Jeremy Corbyn resigned. It wasn't a simple replay of the student radicalism of the 60s. And what they found was up to 78% blamed capitalism for Britain's housing crisis. Um, and it was a survey of about 2000 people. 75% agree that, that climate change is a specifically capitalist problem. And I thought, by the way, that that particular thing is something to hold on to. That if people see that as a specifically capitalist problem, this is major. 70% uh, in this survey agree that capitalism fuels racism. 73% uh, said social assistance would boost solidarity, compassion, and cooperation among people. And 75% agreed with the uh, statement that socialism is a good idea, but has failed in the past because it has been badly done. And they associated it with words like workers, public, equal, and fair. They associated capitalism with exploitative, unfair, and the rich. Now, this is uh, uh, another country, obviously, but it is one that has great similarities to ours um, and is also one that has much more experience with socialism, with socialism being discussed as a, as, as a public concept, something in, in public debate. And I think it is always useful to look at uh, other nations, understanding that things are not directly applicable, just number one for perspective, and number two from the fact that they have had more experience um, in, in these matters. And 
I thought, as I say, the idea that climate change was a specifically capitalist problem, um, I think is something that resonates in this country uh, and that we ought to perhaps pay more attention to. Now, what I'd like to do is switch countries again, and I, I'd like to try to uh, share a screen again. Uh, might be a little simpler. Can I get she a screen sharing? Okay. Can you see it? Uh, it's coming up. Uh, yeah, now we can see it. Okay. So as I promised, I'm switching countries again. Um, sticking to my uh, argument that it is useful uh, in many ways to, uh, to look at foreign uh, examples different than they are, if only for perspective. This is um, a listing of the results of the past six elections uh, in Germany, starting in 2002 and then, they, uh, then 2005 and then every four years thereafter. The ones that are bolded, if you can make that out, are the elections in which the left won a majority uh, of the seats. However, the only election that resulted in a left-wing government is the first one, 2002. So uh, I will try and run through this and make my points in this as I go. The number of seats in 2002, it took 302 seats to, to get a majority. The number changes every year in German elections. They have a, an unusual system um, where what voters do is they vote twice. They vote for their direct representative in their parliamentary district, and then they vote for a party. So that the idea of it is that everyone gets to, each uh, district gets to designate by plurality, which is their preferred individual representative. And then what will happen is the numbers will be balanced nationally to reflect, reflect the percentage that the various parties get. So... In 2002, 302 seats were needed for a majority. And the first number below is 306. That's the number of uh, uh, seats that the governing coalition got. And the governing coalition was the Socialist Party that had 251, they finished first, and the Green Party that had 55 uh, seats, giving them 306 total, they had finished third. So it was a two-party coalition. You didn't need a third party for government. The Party for Democratic Socialism had also won 36 seats in finishing fifth. They were not part of that government. Uh, and again, I, I you know some people here know this story very well. I assume some don't. Uh, the Party for Democratic Socialism was in essentially considered a successor party to the party that had governed East Germany. Um, it was very controversial uh, in some places. The Socialist Party at that point would not have formed a government with that party. And I don't know if the Party for Democratic Socialism would have entered one. It was real a real standoff uh, relationship between the two. Um, but the SPD and the Greens formed uh, a government. It was the first time the Greens had ever been in government. It was fairly uh, famous. Joska Fischer, who was their main leader, became foreign uh, secretary. Um, they, and that's that. The number 342 is the number of total left-wing seats that were held. These 36 were not needed. In 2005, that coalition was not reelected and has not been reelected ever since. Most anyone who knows something about German politics at this point knows that Angela Merkel is right now what we would call uh, a lame duck premier. Um, the, uh, co she is not uh, running uh, in, uh, she was not running for reelection. Um, the Christian Democrats uh, lost the election, or at least in the sense that they didn't finish first. 
And she had governed for 16 years. And that's really the point I want to get at here. And she's been considered this anchor of uh, European politics, not just German politics. Uh, she won four consecutive terms. Now, I mentioned that the bold print here um, is the years when the left won and my, uh, a majority of the seats. And the point is that two separate occasions, 2005, the first one that she came in on, 2013, there were enough seats for a left-wing majority in parliament, two out of her four terms, and including the first one, when she, she probably, if she had not become premier at that point, the party probably would have chosen somebody else and we wouldn't know of her at all. And what happened? Of course, the three parties of the left could not unite. And it happened again in 2013. You need, in 2005, you needed 300 seats for majority. If you added up the Socialist Party, the Green Party, and what is now the Left Party, and again, some of you know this history very well, some probably don't, the Party for Democratic Socialism merged with a group of people who were essentially a break off from the Socialist Party. Uh, Oscar Lafontaine, who had been the lead candidate, you know, the equivalent of Merkel and Schroeder and so forth, would have been prime minister uh, if, his co um, uh, if he had been able to put together a coalition. He left the, the Socialist Party and joined up with the left party. So it gave them something of a, a presence in the uh, Western uh, part of the country. But the three parties would not put together a coalition happened again in 2013. Complicated matter, I'm not gonna do justice to it. Um, there's uh, explanation on both sides. If you think of it as a real problem and you wanna assign blame, there, there'd be blame on both sides. The socialists not willing to uh, be connected with a party that had uh, roots uh, in the governing party of, of East Germany because uh, they considered it not a democratic entity. And on the other side, the, uh, the left not willing to be uh, associated with the reformist uh, socialists. However you want to cut it, the fact is that there was a majority available in both of those elections. Uh, this last time, not so. And we're now going to, uh, you may know, have an extremely confused uh, uh, situation uh, in, uh, in Germany. The socialists are trying to put together a government, but they can't do it from left-wing parties. 368 seats are, are needed. The left-wing parties got 363 total. Even if they had been willing to form a coalition, they couldn't. So the socialists and the Greens are now talking with the uh, Free Democrats who are a libertarian party that would generally align with the, with the right. So, there's one point here, of course, in the failure of uh, parties of the left to unite. And uh, I said that this, um, uh, the, the second inspiration for what I was going to talk about today had to do with a five and a half hour lunch I had in uh, Berlin uh, in August um, with someone named Victor Grossman. Again, I would suspect Victor Grossman is a name known to some, but not all. Uh, if you get Portside, uh, the Portside uh, email blasts every day, there are periodic uh, columns by uh, Victor Grossman or episodic, however you want to say, once in a while, he will write these very detailed articles about uh, German politics and German politics on, on the left. And I had the pleasure of meeting him uh, and having lunch with him that went on for five and a half hours where I sort of got uh, a fair amount of the lowdown on the left party, which was divided among people who fit, thought they wanted to form a left majority and people who would have no part of it. And the no part of it had to do with NATO, the Afghanistan war, et cetera, things uh, not wanting to be a things that uh, associated with policies that I think no one here would want to be associated with either. And my question for him was, was there a way to form a coalition if, if there were the votes at hand where it was understood that the left party would not support 
um, any uh, foreign engagement of German troops, which is their big thing, obviously a very sensitive matter and given the history of, of Germany, um, because it seemed to me that it was imperative for anybody on the left, um, if we claim to have better ways, we have to try and improve the lives of the worker in class, the average person now, tomorrow, next week, as well as at some point in the future. So if there was a way to form a coalition of the left, which would adopt better policies than a coalition of right, of the right, we would be obligated to do so. I mean, I was talking from afar, I couldn't speak authoritatively about that, but that, that was my take on it. And as it turned out, there were not enough seats for this. There's a little more of a story here. Uh, there's a, a, in German politics, there's a, what they call, uh, uh, call more or less a 5% hurdle. If you don't get 5% of that second vote, the vote for a party, you generally get no representation uh, in parliament. You did not make the hurdle. If you got 4.9% of the vote, which is actually exactly what the left party got this time, it's as good as getting zero. There's a technicality, however, which allowed them to actually get their seats. If you win three or more districts on that first vote, where people are voting for their direct representative, you will get all of your vote. Um, what is important here beyond the technicality is the left shrunk substantially. And I felt I got a taste of the problem uh, in the days that I was there. When I was in Germany this summer, um, the Afghan government, the puppet government really of uh, the US, NATO, etc was collapsing faster than anybody thought it would collapse and people thought it would collapse the whole time. So there, have been a, there were evacuations uh, of people who had uh, been involved with the West and, and so on and so forth, who would be better off not having to be there when the Taliban came into office. And you know this was well known in the U.S. Uh, uh, evacuated. I don't know, maybe seventy thousand people. I'm not sure of my numbers. The there was a vote in Parliament in Germany to authorize the German military, which had been the second largest uh, player in NATO uh, during the the war, to uh, authorize them to send in uh, aircraft to evacuate people. Now. It seemed to me clear, whatever, despite the fact that Germany and the US should never have been involved in the thing in the first place, um, the evacuation of people for humanitarian causes before the Taliban government came into, into power seemed to me obviously the right thing to do, the good thing to do. Parliament uh, in Germany approved it overwhelmingly the left party abstained. A few people actually did vote on both sides for and against, but the bulk of the party abstained. And I usually read a, uh, a left-wing German paper when I'm there, the uh, Target Zeitung. And the Target Zeitung was appalled with this position of the left party that it basically was showing itself to be irrelevant. Uh, there's a major vote and you abstain on it. You can't take a position one way or another. And it seemed that they were caught up in their absolute position that German military should never be uh, deployed abroad, even when the point of it was not to wage war. So that is sort of my question uh, that I, I posed, I think, in the, in the description to this. Um, what, are we ready, uh, in this case, were they ready to actually act like they were willing to be a party in power? Um, if you abstain on a matter on that level, then it suggests that you're a critic of government. You're not willing to actually take responsibility for uh, what it does. Okay. Um, so 
On all of that, what do I want to say uh, in conclusion? That we uh, need to, I think, put forward a, a notion of what socialism is as at least as much of a process as a thing, right? That when we talk about socialism or we, we are trying to be good active socialists, what we have to do is a dual thing. We have to keep our feet on the ground that we have to be always critiquing the government that we have, the system, the economic system that we have, but at the same time, always proposing things for the immediate future. At the same time that we keep our eyes on the prize, that we say that no, and this one thing doesn't make it perfect. Uh, this one thing will not change everything that needs to be changed. The problem and the dichotomy, if you look again at, at, at Germany, where it's easier to get a perspective, is I think the critique on the left of most people of the Socialist Party, and this has been the discussion of uh, social democratic parties throughout Europe, that they lost their edge somewhere along the line. It, they, they're, they had lots of reform ideas, lots of them were accepted. People's lives are much better for that, but when a real crisis of the capitalist system came around again, they really had no, no shelf plans for a major makeover, a democratization of the, uh, <clears throat> of the economic system. They had just atrophied in that area. On the other hand, the critique of the left party in okay. Germany, would basically be that they're not prepared to govern, they're only prepared to critique. So we have to, in anything that we do, try and have one foot in either of these tasks. We need to be advocating universal rights, that healthcare, housing, childcare, et cetera, that people quite properly, to harken back to that English British survey, associate with socialism. Uh, and we have to be talking about extending democracy all the way to the economy. And that, you know, socialism is hit with being undemocratic when I don't have to, I don't have to, I think, preach it to this group. We, uh, we're for it because we think it's an extension of democracy. Uh, may I interrupt you, please? Uh, if you don't need the share screen, could you end it that way? Uh, yes, yes. Stop share. Thank you. Uh, you appear okay. much better. There we go. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right. And um, finally, the, the environmental crisis. Um, as I think you know, Someone, could you mute? Um, I'm almost done. Um, so due to the, the environmental crisis, we have people with a global vision that we never had before. I mean, it's not, not new today, last year, but the, the last 25, last quarter, last half century, people have had a global vision. It's not the one that we necessarily envision. The workers of the world unite, it's not so much that, right? Um, but it is an understanding that we're, that is, the globe is round. Everything comes round, the air travels from one country to the other, the heating of one country affects the other, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we could, we could have preached uh, for a hundred years and never had the effect that the, that the uh, environmental crisis has had. People understand that global solutions are necessary. Uh, we might wish they had greater consciousness uh, of the negative effects of our foreign policy, which is global, but we don't get to choose what actually happens. The idea that 
the environmental crisis is a capitalist crisis, which a surprising number of people apparently in the UK, a pleasantly surprising number have, is extremely important. It seems to me that we need to put the question as best we can as, you understand there's a crisis. Does anyone seriously believe that the best method of dealing with it is to have multinational corporations compete against each other for profits around the globe, as opposed to finding a way for governments and world government, if, there were, if we were ever to get to such a thing, to solve the problem in a democratic fashion. The more we can pose it that way, is it, a, uh, do the people get to decide how to save the planet or attempt to save the planet? Or we do, do we trust that to corporate boards whose responsibility is to maximize profit? Uh, the more we can get it posed that way, the easier the question is, because the answer really, I think is obvious. So that's what I had to say. Thank you. So Gene, uh, please. Oh. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Tom. And unfortunately, we had a little break there, but uh, well, we can proceed. And uh, our, our next thing we need to do is we're going to take a short break and um, make a few announcements. First of all, upcoming programs. Right? We, we will just just, take just a little bit. Um, next week, we are still working, exploring a number of possibilities, following certain leads. So we have nothing explicit now. Following that, October 24th, Quo Vadis Turkey, a crumbling fascism in the Middle East under imperialism. And our man in Turkey, Mehmet, will be speaking. He's in Turkey now, but he claims he will come back for that. Um, Sunday, October 31st, Cooperative Economics with our comrade uh, Sharat Lin, uh, will speaking about um, cooperative economics as an alternative to both capitalism and state socialism, existing models of state socialism. Following that on November 7th, which is the anniversary of the great October revolution, uh, we have a session which uh, Raj and myself, um, who disagree on many things, but not on the importance of October. And so it'll be uh, after October, a century of socialist revolution. And we will be discussing that topic. And after that, we're still uh, looking for programs. And if people want to recommend things, be, please feel, feel free to do so. Either email me, Raj, or another member of the program committee. Uh, I don't know if Richard is going to, has anything to say on um, funding. I don't think Richard is in there, in the group today. I didn't notice. So you go ahead and make the appeal unless <clears> Richard <throat> shows up. Okay, well, send us money. Um, <laughs> we, we, we check our webpage. There's a place, log on to where you can log on and send us money. And we do need money. Uh, we do have expenses and we do need to continue to support our library. So with that, um, let me put together a stack here. Um, and uh, I think uh, given um, the loss of time, we can probably run over with our recording a little bit, but uh, we do need to uh, observe um, discipline on the uh, stack. So I will put together a stack. I have Raj and Yusuf so far. If you'd like to be on the stack, please to use the uh, reactions key there to um, raise your hand uh, and I will watch that. Um, so, um, and please limit yourself to uh, um, uh, three minutes, two minutes. And does somebody want to keep time or I'll try to do that. Okay, Raj, you got two, two minutes. Okay, thank you, Tom, for very interesting and informative presentation. I didn't know about this German election that you mentioned and also uh, other parts of your talk. Uh, but uh, uh, I think uh, my uh, understanding of socialism is a little different. 
and I wanted you to say that and you please react to it. And then I'll come up with other questions later on in the program. So my understanding of socialism is from Lenin. I don't know if you have read Lenin. I know you've read Marx, but Lenin, uh, the definition is, is a, this is a period of transition from capitalism towards communism, which you define as to, from each according uh, to his ability to each according to his need. Uh, so the socialism is a stage in which you are transitioning from capitalism towards socialism. And Lenin's understanding of socialism is the workers have seized the means of production. They can run it different ways, but capitalists are no longer running uh, a, 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 any enterprise for capitalist profit, individual capitalist profit. So that is the baseline from which socialism evolves and it can have different forms of expression, but uh, it really isn't ca state capitalism. State capitalism is not socialism. So it's a transition towards communism. Communism is a stage where uh, one no longer needs uh, to be paid according to their work. And in socialist stage, Stalin defines is from each uh, to uh, payment is based on ability, according to the work, not ability, but according to the work. 30 so, seconds left. Yeah, thank you. But uh, uh, I would say that uh, this is different. So the policies that you are saying about uh, going towards socialism is what I would call social democracy, which is still capitalism, but with its surplus being controlled sufficiently so the people can live like human beings. So nobody starves or lives, doesn't have a house to live in and all that. But the relationship pr production is still exploitative. Anyway, you could react to that. Yeah. And, um, Tom, do you want to respond to everyone individually or would you rather wait to respond to a number of people? Gene, my suggestion in this, is, may I say it's a, a, based on Rogers, it's best if we do one by one, uh, uh, that way people don't forget what the question was. So Let me leave it up to Tom, but um, okay. Okay. Tom, do you want to respond to that now or? Well, yeah, I was going to say I've talked for a while. Uh, why don't we get a couple? Okay, um, we'll move on to Yusuf, then Richard W., then then I put myself on the stack. But um, Yusuf, go ahead. You have two minutes. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, you we, let me remark that Die Linke, uh, the, the left party in Germany, has uh, quite consistently taken a hands-off stand in many uh, international issues. It may be because they are divided themselves. Uh, but anyway, um, I have a question about DSA. Uh, I heard uh, uh, from uh, someone that uh, from uh, a, um, a left-wing activist uh, uh, senior, uh, uh, that um, DSA doesn't admit members of um, so-called cadre parties. One, is it uh, true, correct? Uh, second, is it enforced? And three, I think it's rather um, uh, unfortunate, and I think it, uh, it should be revised. Um, uh, uh, also, uh, I heard that there are serious debates with, with, between DSA itself uh, about US, uh, current US policy. Uh, so maybe could you address that? OK, Tom, you wanted to say anything? Uh, you want me to, to uh, speak now? Uh, yeah, I think it'd be a good idea. Okay. Yeah, all right, uh, on uh, what Raj said, well, um, yes, uh, your concept of socialism is quite different than mine. Um, and uh, this is um, the fact 
there's lots of things that could be said about that. Um, I, you know, a Leninist viewpoint is, uh, to me that was that was in place essentially to overthrow the czar 100 years ago, um, and it's not relevant. I do believe in parliamentary democracy. I I do think that the uh, route uh, to any government change is 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 that, um, and the reason. Two things, I suppose. The reason that I uh, was taken by that quote of the socialism in all its shadings is that I think um, we're not going to have uh, people with uh, identical ideas about this. Uh, and this, you know, this sort of relates to, to the second question. Uh, in a situation where people are operating in a, you know, a quasi military situ uh, uh, manner because their, their, their party is illegal and also had communications, you know, far more primitive than, than we have as our disposal. Now, um, it is perhaps, it was reasonable at that point to assume that a decision would be made and everyone would go with it. That has little to do with the current reality. Um, the reason that I highlighted that British survey is that socialism is associated with all sorts of things, people. And those ones that were positive, um, that were mentioned in that survey, these are very useful things. If they think about it, with, about equality, etc., about the working class, we're not going to get people to think that what it means is specifically to take over all industry, um, the government. I don't think it's realistic to be on the agenda. I don't think it, uh, it fits that many people's idea uh, that many people's positive notion of socialism. And in terms of social democratic, I mean, as you know, the, 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 uh, the Bolsheviks themselves were part of the Russian Social Democratic Party. That was the name everybody had. And so you know, it's come down to be sort of reformists have been known as that and, uh, as opposed to the Communist Party, but it's not, uh, not a strict definition. Um, in terms of the second question, uh, yeah, my understanding is that um, members of a democratic so centralist organization are not allowed to be members of DSA. Um, enforced, you know, I, I, I couldn't say, um, these, these, it'd be, it's, it's a tough one to enforce. I don't know of people being expelled from DSA for that reason, but I'm not terribly up on these things. Um, debate in DSA, DSA is totally, did someone mute there? Um, DSA it's in, Richard Fallenbaum, Raj. Um, DSA um, is, you know, very much taken to thinking of itself as a, a big tent organization. Um, there are people in DSA now clearly <clears throat> who were, <clears throat> would never have been in it pre Bernie Sanders, um, who would have, you know, said that that's not, that's not socialism as far as I'm concerned. But after Sanders, it became the thing, you know, and it, it, it's, it's more than 10 times its, its size at that point. So you have like a communist caucus in DSA now. Such a thing would have been unheard of uh, before then. So it's been very broad tent. Um, and in terms of policy, you know, it is, uh, it is nothing like a disciplined organization. So yeah, there are people all over the map with, uh, in, in many respects. I don't know if, uh, to what extent that helps. Uh, thank you. Th thank you, Tom. And let me, uh, the next on the list is Richard W. Um, and then Gene Rule. And I think no one else is on the list after that. But uh, Richard, go ahead. You have two minutes. <laughs> uh, 
we can throw we can throw beer at him now. Um, so uh, first off, I, uh, I I'd like to thank you for your presentation. Um, I think you and I came up in roughly the same milieu. Um, uh, I grew up in Maine, and and um, around the same time you were in Massachusetts. Uh, before I forget, I posted a um, I posted a, a link to uh, the Moon of Alabama uh, uh, in the chat. Uh, it has an analysis on the German uh, on the German uh, election, um, and basically, uh, it's not it's not a, a Marxist analysis; it's a regional analysis. But nevertheless, it's a good read. Um, um, I. I um, uh, I've been hearing this this debate over what constitutes socialism since uh, uh, since I was in high school, basically, uh, you know, uh, and um, and it doesn't seem to end. I guess my my question to you is, um, you uh, I've I've taken to um, uh, I've been more impressed with with the with the with the Chinese uh, mode of operation. Uh, and and that is that they they have they do have a ten year program uh, where they come back and they they apparently reflect on on what's happened in the previous ten years, and and then correct whatever mistakes are made, uh, and then try to and try to, uh, to to carry on from there. Uh, could you could you address the, the Chinese Communist Party uh, and, and that mode of operation? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, Tom, do you want to respond? Um, yeah, I <clears throat> well, as, as you know, I, uh, as I indicated before, I don't think um, uh, I think we have to get used to people having very different notions of socialism if we ever uh, hope to have uh, majority control. I don't consider the Chinese Communist Party a democratic entity. I don't consider uh, the Chinese uh, governmental system democratic. Um, so um, they, you know, they are a, uh, you know, don't get me wrong. It's not like I don't think there are uh, tremendous achievements in some areas. You know, the uh, the number of people raised out of poverty, which is a bottom line socialist consideration, right, uh, is immense. Uh, and uh, was having a discussion with uh, somebody a while ago, just you know, very informally, who, who, what entity could we imagine acting dramatically uh, in uh, in terms of the envir global environmental crisis? It's hard to see the United States doing so. Uh, it's it's hampered so heavily, particularly by the Republicans and you know and the private capital, um, the EU in in mixed you know they actually they they have um their policies in some ways are much more bureaucratic in a sense they're uh, and they can be much more much sharper but of course the unity is much less even in the united states and so the entity we concluded that could probably most dramatically act in that uh, if and when it chose to was probably china uh, because they have uh, centralized command. So, I mean, that, that is the, uh, the range of my thought on, the, and that is the dilemma. Um, so. Okay, uh, thank you, Tom. And uh, so I'm next on the stack, and then we have Norma following that. So let me just... Um, make my comment. First of all, uh, I, I think everybody knows that I disagree. Uh, Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party are my idols. So, um, but I've spoken on that before, so I won't uh, get into it now, but uh, I certainly will later on. But what I wanted to say uh, is I was listening to Richard Wolff talk about the recent elections in Germany. And what he said, I don't usually spend much time with Wolff because I don't agree with him either. But he says some very interesting things, one of which he was saying that in Germany, even though Angela Merkel you know, is no, no more, that, that every worker in Germany enjoys four weeks vacation per year, plus an additional 10 to 12 vacation days per year guaranteed by law. 
and that uh, workers are guaranteed health care going back to the days of Bismarck uh, with the old German Social Democratic Party. Uh, he also mentioned uh, the um, uh, education is free to everyone, tuition free in for all, not only all German residents, but all foreigners getting educated there, which is kind of mind boggling. And so, uh, and, and then he also mentioned a recent uh, um, plebiscite in, in Berlin, I think, where they said, where they decided to basically any landlord that has more than a thousand units are gonna take everything over that away from them and make that public affordable housing. So these sound like very kinds of things that many of us as socialists or we, we you know, uh, really want to have over here. And, but that doesn't go by the name of socialism. So I would just, uh, I don't know if you care to, I, I know nothing about Germany. So I don't know if he, what Wolf says is even true, but uh, you probably know more than I do. So I don't know if you want to comment on that. Thank well, you. Yeah, I mean, to the best of my knowledge, <clears throat> that's all accurate. And, you know, I, I think the, uh, what I think you've said in, in, in passing, I think it is quite right. The, in, in, in phrasing what we think socialism is, what socialists' goals are, we should take credit for things like that. These are of the essence of what socialism is, a greater, a continually greater uh, granting of rights and opportunities to the average person. These things would not have happened in Germany without the Socialist Party and, and at various points, the Communist Party in, in past history. There, there's no question about it. If you, you know, Scandinavia, Sweden, even more so. And why? Because the Socialist Party governed for most of, of the half century. As I mentioned before, you know, the, the Achilles heel, which has been shown uh, in, the, in the most recent economic crisis, is not having greater plans beyond this. And this is where the mainline Socialist Parties fell down. And, you know, like in France, they're, they're fairly wiped out right now. They're not expected to be a factor in the presidential election. Now, French politics are more volatile than, than most other politics and that can, re, can reverse itself. But again, it was, it was uh, the same issue. And one of the reasons that, that I, I look at elections in a place like Germany is if you're going to have a government of the left, which can advance these types of programs, well, you look at the numbers. You're going to have to have people who historically are on the two parties that are historically have their roots on the two ends of the socialist divide, the so-called social democrats and the so-called communists, as well as a party that doesn't see itself as socialist, the Greens. And... I don't see, you know, all of the shadings of socialism. As I say, I think we have to look at it that way. We have to look not to figure out how we differ from everybody else, but to figure out where the points that we can unite with everyone else without look, losing sight of longer goals. Okay. Thank you, Tom. And we'll move over next on the list is Norma and then Kathleen. Uh, so Norma, you have two minutes. Are you at a loss for words? I, 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 I just took the mute off. Um, I don't like the idea that we have to have as our kind of banner statement from each to each. Uh, we need to think that what we're going to demand as we go along is that everybody participate in production, distribution, the whole process of use of our labor <laughs> and, uh, under the idea of enjoyment of life. And if we have to rigidify it under this kind of we're going to measure how much you produce. We're going to then measure how much we give you is the wrong idea. 
for people to be uh, uh, clouded by thinking. Um, and to so we need to find another way to express our participation in society. Uh, the other thing about democratic, I don't expect that Cuba was democratic at, at the beginning of its revolution when it needed to get people <clears throat> to agree that what they were for was for a society which was beneficial for everybody. It's very hard to imagine it. And uh, with Fidel, I suppose, standing up there and saying it's this way, it's that way. And we're not going to allow that uh, revolution to be overthrown by uh, uh, ideas that allow opposition to everybody having a good life. And that was that probably not have uh, probably wasn't very democratic, but it was just kind of going along with the planned economy and making everybody able to take care of everybody. Hello, Tom. It's nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's uh, Tom, do you want to respond? Is it nice to see Norma? Yes, yes, it is nice, Senora. Um, I heartily agree with your your first point um, that um, we um, we should be the people uh, among all these things are complicated, right? We want to be hard edged in terms of criticizing, you know, the, the the current economy and so forth. At the same point, we want to put forward the, the position that we're not here. To, gr uh, to grind the whole time. The whole point of trying to get things for people is that when you pass through this place, it should be, everyone should have an equal shot at, you know. Uh, at, no, at, you know. not an equal shot. And the opportunity has got to go as an idea. We just do it. Well, we can't force people to have fun. That's what uh, I'm saying. Uh, try. <laughs> okay. Um, on... Uh, you know, and, and Cuba, uh, like all of it, like all specifics, you know, the, things get uh, more difficult uh, than than in theory. You know, I, I look at Cuba, you know, and I say, on the one hand, I can't defend a lot of the things that go on. On the other hand, I recognize that the average person in Cuba has much better education, health care than the average person throughout Latin America. And one of the things, of course, that, that is, to my mind, responsible for the distortion um, in, in, in Cuban society is the United States role, right? This, this boycott that, is, uh, that has been voted against virtually unanimously year after year in the UN. And of course, you know, to American citizens, this is such a minor thing. What do they know about it? the people who, who care about it are located in Florida? Um, they're, you know, they're anti-Cuban government. And so they matter in politics in the US and it goes on and on. But uh, we, what percentage of it we're responsible for? I couldn't put a number to it, but it's substantial or we wouldn't still be doing it. We being Washington. Okay, thank you, Tom. And next is Kathleen on the stack. And then after that is Raj. So actually we'll put Sharon before Raj since Sharon hasn't spoken yet. But Kathleen, go ahead, you're up. Or Kathleen's alter ego. Unmute, Unmute there. Yourself. Unmute, please. Hi, Tom. Good to see you. Like and everyone. Uh, well. It seems to me the issue uh, to storm the heavens, or to put it more crassly, to overthrow the empires is unity is key. And I, Tom, I appreciate your remarks on that. And I think that, uh, you know, the uh, approach is gonna have to be, we're gonna have to find the, math calls it the lowest common denominator. We start there, you know, or Lenin talked about, oh, everybody disagrees in the factory, then get a new water fountain, that kind of thing. We have to start there, I think, but the unity is, uh, 
fundamental and it's not easy and it takes a lot of struggle and I wouldn't get caught up in, um, you know, definitions uh, precise. I also don't think we can uh, accept all shadings of people who call themselves socialists. We have to fight that out. And the uh, way of doing that, I think, is, okay, that's your idea. Let's see where it goes. Um, I'm not saying we're going to just bureaucratically outrule them, you know. Uh, but going back to unity again, Cuba's been mentioned. I think Cuba's a good example because I interviewed a lot of people there who were involved in the revolution. And the thing was, they started out, they were assassinating each other, all these different parties. And there were a lot of different parties. And finally, they realized, what are we doing this for? You know, we have similar goals. Let's go for those. And I think that's a good example. Um, Anyway, that's all I have to say on this uh, for now. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Tom. Did you want to remark on that? No. Was that a yes or no? No, no, no. The, the... Okay, we'll we'll move to Sharon, and then we have Raj and Jean again. And if people want to, people who haven't spoken will go to the top of the list. But Sharon, go ahead. Thank you. So Leninism needs to be upheld in this conversation. There's no way we're going to make a revolution without a disciplined cadre organization. That has been true, proven over more than 100 years. And that does not um, mean that we can't have unity among the broad left. We certainly will need it. but. I'm, I'm just upholding the idea that we need a cadre organization and we don't have one that's very strong at least right now. And so I think that one of the biggest tasks of Marxists is to help create one, help to, help to build one. That's all I wanted to say. Okay, Tom, comments? Well, I've... I've repeat myself, though, I don't think a cadre organization is the, the relevant uh, political formation, but those who wish to do so, have at it. Okay, thank you, Tom. And we'll move to Raj, you have two minutes. Okay, Tom, so interesting thing is, there are two words that have always been controversial. One is love, the other is socialism. So they must have something in common also. <laughs> Anyway, the thing is that the way you have defined socialism, all shadings and move towards more rights for people, so forth. Well, then, if you say that is uh, socialism and you unite people on that basis, uniting people for better uh, conditions is a fine. But unless you define something, you're not going to get there. And by your definition, then I think uh, the person you quoted from Republican Party there uh, who said that uh, Democrats are socialists, well, then you're basically agreeing with their definition because it's a Democrats do want to go towards a, even under Biden, that's what they're saying, they get better conditions for working people. And that's always been the approach of Democrats ever since I came to this country, which was in 66. And if you call that socialism, then the charge from the Republican Party it would be true. But we know the Democratic Party, you may be an exception there, are not against capitalism. So one thing is that overthrow of capitalism is an essential feature of socialism. So please react to that because uh, otherwise you are basically agreeing with the Republican party. Now, um, it was probably lost in the shuffle, uh, but my definition of socialism is democratic control of the economy. Um, that the, I think it is important, um, ex both, uh, substantively and politically to be advocating all of these various uh, improvements 
in living conditions that fall short of that, or that are less than that, for example, uh, universal health insurance. I mean, it, 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 to me, it's obvious that that is an essential part of any socialist program, right? Um, but do, would I think that was socialist? No. And the reason uh, that I, you know, I'm bemused by the Republicans is that clearly the bills in front of Congress are not socialist. Um, and why I fastened on the environmental crisis and the notion uh, in that survey of uh, uh, br uh, British youth um, that the environmental crisis was largely a capitalist problem, a capitalist creation, is that I believe that the only way it's going to be overcome is if somehow the people of the nations of the world get control of the economic engines in their countries and direct it to what is necessary, what is not profit-making. But I don't think that saying that equals government control of all ownership, et cetera, of all industry it, um, is necessarily so. I, I don't think um, pieces of that would be very uh, important, but I don't think it's the be all and end all. And I think we need to think about approaching the question from any number of angles. And Maybe. if some of those are worker control, if some of those are community control, they matter. Okay, Gene, may I pursue him just a little bit? Very may briefly. I? Yeah, very briefly. Well, Wait. so the thing is the famous thing about Lincoln, about democracy, you can't fool all the people all the time, right? You can fool some of the people all the times, most of the people sometime, but not all the people all the time. That but was Farnham and Bailey, okay. Ringley Brothers. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, but after uh, mass media and capitalists owning this huge uh, uh, opinion generation has come into being the mass, uh, what I call uh, propaganda of the capitalist class, is, is this democracy that you call about, is that possible? That's the only question I have. Okay, I agree with so you, democracy. Okay, democracy, but democracy under these conditions is not well, feasible, is my assertion. Well, our goals may not be winnable. There, there's no guarantee, obviously, that this comes out our way. We don't create the circumstances that we have to labor within. They own all this stuff. Yeah, wish they didn't, but they do. And we have to figure out how to work around it. What I'm saying is without overthrowing oh, capital, get back. Do. Raj, go back on the stack, please. Um, so it's uh, my turn now for my brief th thing. And, um, you know, I don't get around much, as everybody knows, but I did go to Cuba in uh, 1998 for the 150th anniversary of the publication of the Communist Manifesto. And one of the North American comrades at one of our sessions said something to the effect that how can you call yourself democratic when you only have one political party? And the response was, under Batista, we had seven political parties. Now we have one political party and we have democracy now. And that was basically Marxist, uh, from Marx's um, uh, civil war discussion of the, of the Paris Commune. So I think that's important. And uh, if you look, and also if you open your little red book, I'm sure everybody has Mao's little red book, and look at the frontispiece there, you'll see Mao voting in the 1953 elections in China. And it has been democratic ever since. It is the largest democratic uh, country democracy in the world and most effective, I would say. There are regular elections. Uh, everyone votes, more people vote than even in, in uh, uh, or at least comparable numbers 
as in India or any other country, and they are effective. They have improved the well-being of their people more than anybody else, and they're overwhelmingly supported. So uh, if you're talking about democracy, I think China is a very good example of workers' democracy. Just because certain people don't like what they're doing, that's another question, but the Chinese people overwhelmingly endorse it. So uh, you can comment on that, Tom, or not, or... Well, I suppose uh, I, I could raise Raj's uh, point raised to me, right, in terms of control of the media. Uh, I don't think there's any debate that the media is uh, centrally controlled there. Um, uh, some, um, you know, we can watch the situation in Hong Kong, obviously, it seems to me, where um, opinion that differs is being squeezed out. I think it's clear. Uh, I'll just mention that Donald Trump could never run for office in China, and that's a good thing. But is anybody else on the stack? People are speechless. Um, okay. Well, maybe. Yeah. What do you want to do, Jean, at this point? I could say, I could say something. Norma? OK, can you I say it? I was just getting ready. I was just getting ready. Just getting ready to put it in the uh, in the chat. It's a, a tangential comment. Uh, the IRA is rising. It was just reported on PBS. I think PBS yesterday. I'm very pleased. I've been telling people we've been living in an Irish peace. That is the actually basically the first world has been kind of not responding in particular ways to the, uh, I see Rich is putting his hand up, uh, Rich Johnson. Um, anyway, the people living in the first world have kind of accepted a status quo of existence in spite of the many contradictions, the winning by the rich of uh, a different uh, of, possibility of maintaining themselves versus the scrabbling along that the middle classes have been doing. So hopefully this will, I, I, I mean, it's hard to put the whole requirement on the IRA, which has become, which has become active again in uh, Northern Ireland, but I do. Okay, thank you, uh, Norma. And you say Rich Johnson? Wants to talk? Yes, yes, he wants to yeah. say something. Can you hear me? Okay, go ahead. Is my audio on? Yes, Your audio, my audio on. on. Can you hear You're me? Fine. Okay, thank you. thank you. Okay, yeah. Uh, so anyway, um, well, I just want to speak briefly to this point of a democracy and make one point about this. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> uh, people say, uh, have opinions as far as I'm concerned. Uh, from uh, wh wherever they get their information about a democracy in China or Cuba or wherever. And uh, I, in, in, <laughs> in, uh, in defense of democracy uh, uh, in general, I would uh, say uh, my opinion, <laughs> which is, uh, you know, different people, different cultures, different histories, uh, different countries with different histories, et cetera, they can define democracy any way they want or, uh, and that means it's a little too broad, but uh, you know uh, whether uh, Fidel and the Cuban uh, government, et cetera, uh, were democratic, perceived as democratic by uh, the Cuban people uh, in general, the nine million people or whatever, uh, uh, whether they considered uh, the government at, uh, at the time, uh, you know. Before, before Fidel died and now after, uh, is their form of democracy or not? I think it's up to them. I'm sorry, it's their, uh, it's their decision, you know? Same thing with China. And uh, I think uh, some of the things like uh, uh, that I remember that uh, Eugene said about uh, uh, the Chinese, uh, uh, I'm not sure maybe one other person was uh, defending or trying to express their understanding of the democracy in China uh, for, for in particular. 
uh, same thing. But uh, you know, I know that uh, uh, last I heard, there was about 1.4 roughly billion people in China. Uh, maybe it's more or less now. And uh, and I think there's a million people in the uh, party, roughly. 30 That's seconds, right. 95 million, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Okay, 95. Oh, okay, a million so people in where, in where were you saying, Rich? A nine, million nine, people where? 90 million, 90 million people in China in the party at whatever level with whatever kind of experience. But my point is, Chinese culture over the 5,000 years, whatever, um, you know, <laughs> they have their own uh, ex culture, their own experience, uh, which for 100 years or more, uh, 100 years ago, you know, before 1910 uh, or whatever, before uh, 1949, uh, you know, it was dominated by the British and the uh, Western imperialism, whatever, uh, you know, so we're, we're supposed to define their experience and whether or not uh, uh, they're satisfied with their party or whether they get to vote or whether they get to express themselves on any level or whatever, or how our definition, okay. which I don't even think uh, is very Mitch, clear. That's, ever, that's been three minutes. Uh, and you we're follow. Approach, we are approaching 1230. We have three people who want to speak. Raj, Yusuf, and Richard W. Uh, I suggest each of you make a quick comment, one minute each, and then we'll go to Tom for his wrap up because it's we are very close. So one minute each, Raj, Yusuf, and Richard W. was on there, but he's not again. Raj, go ahead, one minute. Thank you, Gene. Uh, yeah, I want to agree with Tom that socialist movement has this problem of democracy. I think whenever they overthrew capitalism, they had to have controls and then eventually uh, a party began to control and there was problem with uh, masses participating in it. So I think I, we should acknowledge that we are, Tom's point is, is well taken. And I don't mean any specific country, that's a problem. We haven't been, socialism has solved. The other problem is the capitalism hasn't been able to solve. Within capitalism, how the democracy works, it's just get distorted by people who have money, which is the capitalist class. And they control the whole process. So we're caught between these two things and we haven't figured out a way out of it. And, and production by government under socialism has been a problem. So I want to acknowledge what Tom is saying there are legitimate things we should be honest and examine these things critically. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's, uh, now, Yusuf has. Uh, Kit, Kit was asking to speak, uh, Rich's partner. Okay, well, before her, there is Susan has her hand up. So, Yusuf, why don't you take one minute and then we'll ask for uh, Susan and then Kit, both of whom will have. Uh, two minutes and then we will go to Tom for a summary. Uh, well, yeah, let me uh, remark that uh, many so-called um, democracies, uh, uh, capitalist democracies uh, actually uh, are, are far more repressive than uh, China or than current China uh, or Cuba uh, and, or, or, and Vietnam uh, is right uh, now. Uh, and uh, uh, for example, I know uh, Turkey, and um, Turkey had the most uh, the imprisoned journalists, uh, actually. Uh, uh, and considering the, uh, that uh, Turkey has uh, much less of a population than China, uh, well, you do the math. Uh, so I think, uh, the, uh, unfortunately, people in, in, in the left have been um, um, I have not uh, uh, taken proper consideration of this uh, by people on the left, uh, uh, including people like, uh, 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 including parties like the SA. Um, uh, hey, that's, that's one minute. So uh, let's move on to Susan. Uh, you have, uh, we'll, since you haven't spoken yet, we'll give you two minutes and also get two minutes. Go ahead, Susan. Okay. Unmute I am unmuted. 
Um, thanks, Tom, for your presentation. And thanks, Raj, again, for your summary of the vice we're in, the difficulties. Um, I think the discussion about China and Cuba has to do with the concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat, which was in Marx and was dealt with in the new Soviet Union. Um, it's really difficult to make changes in, in our society, to make a revolution and to build socialism. So I think we need some humility. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Susan. And is Kit on? Yes, hello. Okay, you have two um, minutes. Okay, Go thank ahead. you. Just quickly. I think this is a good conversation and uh, frankly I'm not crazy about when people argue a lot and the things start to break down so I think this is productive that we need to exchange these ideas and include social democrats so that we can clarify things hash things out and for a public audience this is a public audience um, I have a lot of friends who are social democrats are interested in that um, but you know they think communism is too harsh so for you know different reasons um, anyway, but we need more socialists in government with practical experience in this country. And we don't have enough of that. Um, you know, government has really good benefits for its employees, its workers, uh, if it's, especially if it's unionized. Um, and these benefits should be extended to all workers. Uh, working for an exploitive com company is just, you know, not, doesn't help anybody. Uh, and people recognize that. Um, so, you know, if the government was involved in our benefits and people understood how it worked, uh, they, you know, I think they'd be more for it. Um, you know, being progressive is not a good running for government because, you know, we have, we have real differences with your, um, and, you know, we can name some names, but uh, when we have a conservative run, running the show, you know, progressives are better. Uh, and, you know, we need unity as a goal, I think, among all of us, um, even though it's, it won't be perfect. We're not perfect human beings, uh, let alone, you know, leftists, especially, you know, we're you know, leftists is notorious for, for splintering so much. Um, and the right wing recognizes this. So we need to build on our, our unity. Um, and not everyone will want to be part of cadre or be in that position because it's, it's pretty difficult to be in a cadre organization. It's like being in the military, um, but it does need to be developed and people need to have that opportunity to understand and you know, consider that, those roles. That's been um, one minute. Well, we have a long way. Okay, we have a long ways in educating us in the United States, a really long ways. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And the stack is now closed. We will have for the Tom will have a chance to give his final comments as long as he wants, and uh, then the moderation will stop. But we will continue to discuss things, and we'll get rid of the two-minute limit. Uh, so, Tom, uh, please. Jane, uh, before uh, Tom uh, starts, may I say something for, uh, organizationally? I have made use of the quotes, so I have to step away at this point. Yusuf, could you be at the controls technically? Okay, yeah. So I'll stop the recording after um, uh, uh, Tom's so, remarks. Okay. After Tom's remarks, yes. So Tom, um, you get the okay. final word. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I refer to foreign countries, foreign examples with great hesitation at all times, be simply because they are someone else's experience and not ours. But you know, the, the ones I referred to uh, being the UK and Germany um, were, were chosen in part because I thought they were reasonably comparable to us in terms of the, the structures of their society. So that there, there might be uh, things to learn from that. Um, in, in terms of discussing um, democracy or the lack of it in China, Cuba, or the Soviet Union way back when, um, we are, I mean, they, they're, they're interesting academic questions, um, but I'm not sure they're more than that. Um, 
years ago, I remember being at uh, a, a lecture and somebody was uh, questioning about uh, the speaker about Cuba. He says, look, I am not here to defend the government of Cuba. I am here to say hands off Cuba. And I think there has been a, there's an understandable tendency that when we oppose the United States policy towards a government, then the enemy of the enemy is our friend. In other words, we feel we have to defend that government. The Vietnamese War, right? We should never have been in there. I consider it the, 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 the finding uh, political experience of my life. That doesn't mean I defend or did defend the, uh, the, uh, the North Vietnamese government at that time. I defended their right to get the US out, uh, that the US should lose that war. They never should have been there. But similar with China today, we should do anything we can to prevent the United States from using China as the latest opportunity to gin up the war machine. That does not mean we have to defend China's structures. Cuba as well, the blockade should end. That does not mean that we need to somehow define in our mind that their government structure is good. Some people may want to do that, of course, but it doesn't follow from it, uh, from opposing US policy. Sorry, this is uh, getting this noise that I can't prevent at this point, I've tried. Um, the, somebody mentioned the dictatorship of the proletariat. I think that is a phrase and a concept that should be lost for all time. I, my belief is that Marx essentially raised it as a quip, right? In terms of saying, and, and, and discussing the uh, Paris Commune that we've always had a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. So, hey, we got a dictatorship of the proletariat. That's my belief of where that phrase came from. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe it was serious. Whether he was serious or not, we do not want to be associated with the concept of dictatorship, nor should we think in reality that one class and one class only should, uh, should govern society. Uh, what we should be associated with, apart from all questions as to whether one thinks China is in its own way democratic, or Cuba is its, in its own way democratic, that we are the most democratic force in this country. We are the ones who want to bring capital to heal. We are the ones who want to see the people rule and figure our way out of the mess that the capitalist economy has got itself into. That's our focus. That's where we need to be that all of those nice things that the Brits associate with socialists, we want to be associated with legitimately. The idea that socialism is a great idea, but that it's been handled badly in the past, we should be right there. Thank you. We want to force okay, Tom, our, hold it. our Tom, opinion. Up. You're not recognized. Please don't speak. I thought we're Thank done. You, Tom. We will end the, the uh, recording here with your eloquent words. I think that's very good. Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat at our in-person forums, Please send contributions to our treasurer, either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday, S-U-N-D.
D-A-Y, at yahoo.com. And the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F-A-L-L-E-N-B-A-U-M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Nebro Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California, 94609, or directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml. Info for information, write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org and the website is marxistlibr.org.